That was some worship, huh? Oh, that was fantastic. Well, let's continue on in our worship with a word of prayer, and then we'll look at God's word this morning together. You pray with me. God, your name will be praised, and we pray that this is a place where that happens. We thank you so much for ushering us into your presence this morning. And now, may we worship you with our attention as you speak to us through your word. Give us everything we need to put what you teach us this morning into practice. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. It's good to be with you. Well, recently, I had a conversion experience. Now, it wasn't my first I, uh, my most significant conversion experience happened when I was 15 years old when I was converted to Christ. But this recent conversion that I went through, some liken to actually converting into a new religion. No, I haven't converted to a new religion, but I have converted from being a cat person to being a dog person. <laughs> now... Hear me out. As I prepared for this sermon, and I felt like God was nudging me to disclose this, I don't think I've ever prayed more for the unity of the church than leading up to this sermon. And I thought I prayed hard during COVID and during the political cycle we went through, but no, outing myself as a dog person, I feared for a church split right before my eyes. And so I'd like to remind us that I think here at New Community Church, in essentials, we have unity, and non-essentials, liberty, and all things charity. So this morning, I'd like to think that my position on dogs falls under something that should be given liberty and charity, but I guess we'll find out, huh? (laughs) See, for 10 years of my marriage with Katie, we had two cats, Emma and Zorro. And I, I I, I loved them for many reasons. Chief among them was that they were very self sufficient, you know, put on enough food and enough litter, and you could ignore them for weeks. You know, they were impossible to take for walks. I actually tried that once. It was hysterical. And they spent most days like a college freshman home on spring break, just sleeping the day away. And our story with those cats, even though it spanned over a decade, can be summarized very quickly. The cats were great, and then the cats were fine, and then the cats were gone. They were great when it was just Katie and I, and we didn't have any other living things in our home that we had to care for. But then we moved to California, and we had our first child, and the cats went from being great to just fine. And then we had our second child, Judah, who was allergic, and then the cats were gone, and that was it. (laughs) So now, I would say to say that I loved cats was probably saying too much. The reality is, I did not like dogs. In fact, I couldn't understand anybody who loved dogs. When people would talk about their love for their fur baby, I would go through four out of the five stages of grief almost immediately. (laughs) I'd race through denial, anger, bargaining, and depression, but I would never get to acceptance of their love (laughs) of dogs. So when my children during COVID, decided that being a dog, or that getting a dog would be a great idea, I knew exactly what I needed to do. I needed to get new kids. (laughs) That plan didn't work out because wherever we forgot them, they always wandered and found their way home. But instead, we bought some time. Katie and I uh, thought that a great idea, instead of getting a dog, would be to get some fish. That'll be great, we thought. It'll be just as engaging of having eight things in a glass tank you can't touch. That'll be just like having a dog. And we had a good run with the fish until the great fish genocide of 2020. (laughs) The details surrounding this event aren't entirely clear, but seven of the eight died after I cleaned the tank. (laughs) Clearly, I did something wrong. The eighth succumbed later out of, I think, just sadness. So we found ourselves petless again, and I found myself loving my family again. (laughs) But as time went on during COVID, I began to hear hushed conversations behind cracked doors. And I would hear words like puppy, or this pretentious French-sounding phrase, Bichon (laughs) Frise, whispered behind those closed doors. But I'm not a dog person, so there's no way that that was happening, this canine coup under my own roof. (laughs) But before I knew it, I was in the car driving four and a half hours to the middle of Nowheresville, Pennsylvania, (laughs) 
to a Bichon Frise breeder's home where some woman I didn't know and I'm not sure I liked put this puppy into my arms. I could almost hear the faint whisper from heaven, Adam, Adam, why have you persecuted me? And in that moment, it was as if scales fell from my eyes. I knew immediately I'd give my life for this dog. I was converted. I left my old ways behind. I had a new set of priorities. I really had a new life, and I now show all the marks of a true believer. Even my screensaver on my phone, which used to be a picture of, I can't even remember, I think it was like my wife or kids or something like that, (laughs) is now this picture. It's like a doggy glamour shot, right? (laughs) Setting up the fan to get that was very difficult. (laughs) So now my sweet Minerva McGonagall Jackley, we call her Minnie, um, now is on my phone. This was such a complete conversion for me that when I would pick up the dog or pet the dog, rather than saying, oh, that's so cute, my family would say, it's so weird to see you with the dog. But I mean, you tell me. Go to that next picture. Is that weird? (laughs) This is the glorious image of a man converted. (laughs) And this morning, we're going to talk about conversion. Now, despite how dramatic my conversion, and I wouldn't say, you know, I love dogs, but I really love my dog, right? Despite how dramatic that conversion is, When people think about conversion, they usually don't think about me. They think about Saul on the road to Damascus. So we can talk about him if you want, unless you want to hear more about my dog. (laughs) But I guess because we're going through the book of Acts and this is where we are, we'll talk about Saul today. And by the way, let me just warn you, I guarantee you, I will interchange the name Saul and Paul and I won't even know I did it and I'll just keep trucking along. So just stay with me, okay? So we're going to look at Saul. It's the most famous conversion in the New Testament, and we're going to look at three aspects of it as we look at chapter 9 of the book of Acts, and there are these three. We're going to look at what Saul was converted from, we're going to look at what Saul was converted to, and lastly, we'll look at why it matters for us. So first, we'll dive right in. Let's look at what Saul was converted from. Now, many people know a lot about Saul. He did later become the apostle Paul. But in his pre-Christian life, most people know some significant but sketchy details about him. If you were to poll this congregation, I bet you'd say, hey, we know he was passionate about his Jewish faith, and we know he was passionate about his hatred of Christians. He was an observant Jew. He kept all the 613 laws indicated in the Old Testament. And as an extension of that, he hated people who didn't do that. And we get a brief description of what Saul was like right out of the gates in chapter 9. It's verses 1 and 2. Let me read them for you. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found there any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So we get a sense that Saul really didn't like Christians. He was there for the stoning of Stephen. He sanctioned it. We know that Saul was likely to find Christians and either arrest them or torture them or kill them. But it begs the question, why? We know that about Saul, but we don't know why he was like that. So we need just a little bit of background to understand fully the place Saul was coming from. We get a little picture of Saul who wrote this as the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians. This is just a snapshot of what he was like. It says this. It says, If anyone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Saul had every reason to put confidence in his pedigree, in his upbringing. He did all the things that you needed to do when he was of age. But even before that, he was born into the right family. He had the right ceremonies done to him at the right time. So he even had a lineage that said, we care so deeply about your identity as a faithful Jew 
that we are going to make sure you're circumcised on the eighth day. And by the way, you won the cosmic lottery because you were born into the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. This was a very small, select class of people. And Saul embraced that identity. He was passionate about at least two things. He was passionate about Torah and temple. The Torah is that first five books of the scriptures where lots of the law is found. 613 laws by many people's count. And you were on the hook to obey them all, all the time. So Saul would have grown up praying the prayers when you were supposed to pray them. He would have prayed that great prayer in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, hear, our, hear, uh, hear, o Israel the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He would have done so with those little, uh, what do you call them, tephilim, I think they're called. They're those little leather boxes with these scriptures in them that you might see pictures of Orthodox Jews tying to their wrists and foreheads. He would have been saying those prayers time and time again. He would have celebrated all of the festivals. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Purim, Passover, all of these great festivals, he would have been chief among the people celebrating them. And he would have known the great stories of God. All of those festivals and the scriptures themselves told a story of a great God that selected a people, Israel, to be set apart and holy and different. That's why Saul spent his days obeying the law, his diet, his dress, his days, and even his desires, all reflected what God's word said was important. But he didn't just love the Torah, he loved the temple. And put quite simply, he would have died to defend its honor. But if you know anything about the history of Israel, sometimes the temple was overtaken by foreign enemies. And sometimes its worship was desecrated and idolatrous worship was put in its place. See, Saul would have known this storied history of God rescuing a people Israel pulling them out of slavery in Egypt and blessing them and showing kindness to them. But time and time again, Israel would wander away. They would look at their neighbors and say, I want what they've got. And so they'd worship idolatrous gods and they would be punished for it. And amidst those group of wayward people, there was always a small category, a contingent of people that were described as having zeal for for the Lord. They were the ones who wouldn't compromise, who wouldn't give up. They would give their own lives in defense of the principles of God. Put quite simply, zeal in the history of Israel worked. There was something about people taking zeal of the Lord so passionately that God would see it and honor it. When people were zealous about the Torah and zealous about the temple, God showed up. In fact, zeal was one of the most prized characteristics in the Jewish mind. We're talking about this because to understand Saul, you need to understand zeal. See, zeal worked all throughout the history. Maybe the most prevalent place it worked was with a man named Phineas. Zeal worked for Phineas. Maybe you know the story, maybe you don't. Phineas was the grandson of Aaron, you know, Aaron, the brother of Moses. And so Phineas, during the wanderings of, of Israel in Egypt, was one of the high priests. And Phineas was zealous for God. And on one occasion, though, the, this was near the end of their wanderings, all of Israel was tired. There was a lot of law following, and a lot of wandering through the desert just kind of made you weary. And idolatry began to creep in. Compromise began to creep in. And so people in Israel were starting to look to their Moabite neighbors, and they want what they had. And so many Israelite men would take Moabite girlfriends, and they would worship Moabite gods. And God was not happy. That was about the most unzealous thing you could do. And on one occasion, Phineas and another group of zealous people were before the tent of meeting where God's presence was housed. And they were crying out to God, weeping because God had made a plague come upon them to punish them for their disobedience. And as they're crying out to God, weeping about the sad state of affairs that Israel's under, an Israelite man walks by with his Moabite girlfriend straight into their tent to do what I'm sure you know they might want to do. And Phineas snapped. He had it. Out of his zeal for the Lord, he raced in to that tent. And while the two were in the act, he grabbed a spear and drove them both through. This is how the story is recounted in the book of Numbers. It says, the Lord said to Moses, Phineas 
son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites, since he was zealous for my honor among them as I am. I did not put an end to them in my zeal. Therefore, tell him I am making a covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. Zeal worked. Phineas shows up and does something unthinkable, and God honored it. And all of Israel saw that. The plague stopped. Right worship was restored. Zeal worked. So much so that this is how that story is remembered again in the book of Psalms. Again, Saul would have known this well. Psalm 106. But Phineas stood up and intervened, and the plague was checked. This was credited to him as righteousness for endless generations to come. Righteousness was that unviolable, inviolable, special relational standing with God. And this act of zeal was credited to him as righteousness. You might hear the echo of uh, the story between Abraham and God, where Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Zeal got Phineas what everyone wanted, a special standing before God. His actions made him a hero. And so there is a long line of zealous people that follow in his footsteps. Zeal worked for Elijah. You might remember Elijah calling down fire from heaven on these idolatrous Baal worshipers. And God rained down fire and smited them all. Zeal worked for a man named Judas Maccabeus. Now, you may not know his story as well. It's in the apocryphal books. If you had a Catholic Bible, they'd show up in that thicker part in the middle. But Judas Maccabeus is remembered during Hanukkah. See, Judas Maccabeus saw that at one time in Israel's history, the Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes, conquered the temple and and instilled and instated pagan idolatrous worship in it. And Judas Maccabeus snapped. He couldn't take it. Out of his zeal, he looks at the odds and he said, Syria is way more powerful than we are, but we will die defending the temple. And so Judas Maccabeus raises up an army, and against all odds conquers the temple again for God. He kicks the Syrian enemies out. In fact, it worked so well that Israel had an independent state for over a century because of the zealous acts of Judas Maccabeus. Zeal even worked for Jesus. Jesus had an intense love for the temple. He would go on to teach different things about it, but when he saw his father's house, the temple, he loved it. And on one occasion, you may remember it well, he goes into the temple and he sees people changing money and selling sacrifices. And what does he do? He flips over tables, gets a whip, and drives them all out. And as that story was remembered, do you know how it ends in the book of John? We read these words. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal was something that you needed to have if you wanted to be a faithful Jew. And as those memories of zealous acts defending God's honor at all cost filled the memory of Israel, that would have trickled down and filled the mind of Saul. Saul wanted nothing more than to be zealous from the Lord. But he had examples that were held up and rewarded and applauded, like that of Phineas, who would do violence to anyone who stood in the way of God's honor. That is why someone like Saul was breathing murderous threats towards Christians, because he saw them as the same long history of compromisers towards the faith. So yes, we know that Saul didn't like Christians and Saul killed Christians, but there was a deep theological reason why. Maybe you've heard it said before, Saul was doing what he thought was right by breathing out murderous threats to Christians. So first, we've discovered that that, that zeal, that picture of what it is to be devoted to God, that is what Saul was converted from. Well, what was he converted to? The short answer is Saul was converted to Jesus. The last thing Saul wanted to become was a Christian. And yet on one day, thanks be to God for it, he yielded 
and surrendered to the God who revealed himself to him. Saul experienced this direct personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a product of divine intervention. This was so well attested to that some commentators would say, if you want to know if Christianity is of divine revelation, just look at how the apostle Paul was saved. Well, how does this story go? Verse 3. As he, Saul, near Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, there's a zillion things worth noting here, but let me draw our attention to a couple. First, Saul is confronted by two things. This dramatic light. Now, this was in the middle of the day. The sun was at its highest and brightest point. So for another light to outshine the sun and knock you to your knees, you know it was pretty bright. But second, he was, he was uh, encountered by this voice from the heavens. And we have this thing called a double vocative. It's just the name twice. It's this classic pattern of how God will cry out to people from heaven. You can make Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Moses. This double vocative is how God calls out. And Jesus immediately makes things personal. Not only just saying Saul's name, Saul, Saul. But notice what he says. He says, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting followers of Jesus? He says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus always makes things personal. See, Saul might have been saying, I've never persecuted Jesus personally. Oh, yes, I've persecuted his followers time and time again. But I don't think I've ever persecuted Jesus personally. But maybe in those moments, he remembered that Jesus promised such solidarity with his believers that he would say things like, whatever you did for the least of these followers of mine, you've done for me. So when you feed or clothe the least of these, you're feeding and clothing Jesus himself. And if that applies to the good, it probably applies to the bad. So Jesus is saying, sure, you didn't persecute me directly, but you persecuted my followers, and that's just as good as persecuting me. What goes on? It says, who are you, Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Now, I have read this a lot of times, and I've read a lot about it. And some people start out of the gate saying, well, based on this, Saul says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus has to answer him, I am Jesus. That Saul probably didn't know who was speaking at that time. I beg to differ. Now, I hope we've done enough work to get this. We could do a lot more. But Saul knew the scriptures better than most. He was in that elite class of people who would have known the scriptures. He would have felt them down to his bones. And as he's on his way to Damascus, what is he met by? Light and a booming word from heaven. Now check your mental Rolodex, or you could Google search this in your brain. Can you think of any other passages in scripture where light and a voice show up. And let me give you a little clue. Think real early in the Bible. Let there be light. And God created the heavens and the earth. Do you think that a guy like Saul, a Hebrew of Hebrews, would have missed that wink and a nod from God? That in the middle of the day, a light shines and calls out to him, Saul, Saul, in something new is made in that moment. That was not lost on Saul. This was a mini creation event. It happens to every Christian. They're made new in that moment by the light that shines into their heart and the voice that beckons their soul come home. This is how God would always show up. Light and voice. He did it to Moses at the burning bush. The pillar of fire and the pillar of uh, leading Israel through the wilderness and showing up on Mount Sinai. Even the Shekinah glory in the temple, which Saul loved, would have been marked by its light of the presence of God. And so here, he hears this voice from heaven. And he says, it is I, Jesus. This was God in his second person, Jesus, who was risen, alive, co-equal, and reigning with his Father in heaven. This would have exploded Saul's category of what was possible, that God was in Jesus. And certainly, Saul would have known in those moments, as he realized 
that it was Jesus speaking, that he really was persecuting Jesus. See, we don't just need that New Testament scripture, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. See, Paul would have known so well the words of David when he said, after his sin against Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, who did David say he sinned against? God and God alone. Jesus always makes things personal. And he is having a personal encounter with Saul, and he's converting him. He's changing him. He's making him new in this mini act of creation with light and his word. And Saul was converted to Jesus. But he wasn't converted to this long list of rules and regulations that Saul would have been very comfortable memorizing because he was so good at that. He immediately gets brought in, not by the theological concepts, but by the Christian story. He's a He swept up into the family of God. Listen to how the story continues. I'll read some of it, and I won't make very many comments. It says, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anybody. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. Now, I just can't resist. You've got to love these little clues that God is leaving. Does this sound familiar? Somebody else for three days deprived from food and water deprived from light? Jesus, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay. What goes on? In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place hands on him to restore his sight. Now, Saul would have known how to pray. You've got to imagine he's praying the Psalms. He's praying that Shema, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But maybe for the first time, those prayers are directed towards Jesus. He goes on. Lord, Ananias said, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from chief priests to arrest all who call in your name. It gives you a sense of how scary a guy Saul was, that Ananias having the direct revelation of God in a vision, being told to do something very specific, was like, I don't know, Lord, you're breaking up. Are you sure you want me to do that? <laughs> it gives you a sense of how terrifying a man Saul was. But the Lord said to Ananias, it goes on, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. It goes on. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is one of those passages I can get a little emotional reading. Ananias summons the courage of obedience and goes to Saul. Now, let me just make sure we're st- keeping with the story. Three days ago, Ananias was exactly the kind of person that Saul would have hunted down and killed. That's why he was scared to go see him. And he walks in, and how does he greet this guy who has killed some of his friends? Brother Saul. And he puts his hands on his head. You know, a few years ago at, uh, in Kid Zone during the morning on Thursdays, we take communion down here. And there's a guy in our church, our church, I don't know if I saw him here this morning, I don't know if he'd even remember this, but Sam Blair, he and I go way back. Um, he was serving me communion that day. And you've got to forgive me if I get a little emotional. It was this small act, so I'm kneeling on the kneelers, and he gave me the bread, and he grabbed my head, and I don't even remember the prayer, but he whispered a prayer in my ear. And I'll tell you what, I felt the palpable presence of God there with me. Where two or three are gathered, there I am with them also. I got to feel that. I got to live that. And I can't help but think that that's exactly what Saul felt. This guy who he had hated, who was terrified of him, comes in in his moment of need and vulnerability and says, Brother Saul, and grabs his head and heals him. God isn't just giving Saul this list of to-dos, this list of rules and regulations. Saul's conversion was one of being swept up into the great community 
of God. Maybe (laughs) Saul was remembering Jesus saying, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Saul got to live that in those moments. See, Saul was being welcomed in to the family of God. The story goes on. It says immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. It goes on at once. He began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Saul didn't go through any exhaustive evangelistic training. He wasn't qualified in any way other than God had called him out and rescued and saved him. But he got in the game. And if we finish this passage, all these verses, we'd see that Paul continued to preach, proving that that Jesus was the Son of God and the Messiah. And over the next nine verses following this, he has conspired to be killed. He escapes from that threat on his life by being lowered through a city wall in a basket. We've all been there, right? (laughs) He faces more resistance from other disciples who struggle, believe he's actually in the community of God. When he's finally accepted, he goes out and he preaches more and more about Jesus. And he does so so effectively that people now want to kill him. And amidst all that, the church grew. And a time of peace was ushered in by Saul's transformed zeal. Exactly what has always happened when people stand up for God. See, his zeal against the church was turned into zeal for the church. This man, Saul, who had built his life around gaining a righteousness that could have been gained by being born into the right family and doing the right things, now had a righteousness given to him apart from anything he did. His whole world was changed. Paul the apostle would go on to write this. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Can you imagine Saul saying that? There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. This is a man converted. Everything he thought, everything he built his life on was now converted to Christ and his kingdom. In his ways, and Saul wasted no time and dove in head first. Can you imagine someone like Saul saying things like, righteousness is now found through faith, that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile? That is a man converted. Well, finally, in the 38 seconds we have left together, why does it matter to us? I'll tell you why I think it matters. See, I think most people read this story And they go, I've never had my road to Damascus story. I'd be a Christian when I was seven. I barely even knew it happened. But, you know, here I am today. See, I think we all kind of, and I used to hear this all the time in student ministry. You got to love it. And sorry if you're a kid and you've said this, like, sorry, but not sorry. You hear people say, well, I don't have a very good conversion story. You ever heard that? Mine's not really. It's like you want to be the syndicate crime boss who then was, like, converted. And then you spend the rest of your days serving the poor in Calcutta. That's the kind of conversion story everybody wants. But some people are like, well, you know, I really disobeyed my parents when I was four. And then I met Jesus, and it's been the straight and narrow ever since, right? (laughs) There's not a lot of backstory there. But let me encourage you. The reason why I think this story matters to us is because if you look and track Paul's story, you know what he prided himself in? He said, all that stuff I used to do, I consider rubbish. But you know what's great is that I am someone that used to be separated from God by my sin, and now I'm not. I am someone who is reconciled to God and will never be apart from his presence, now into eternity. I am someone who is forgiven 
washed clean, adopted into the family of God. I am a brother and sister of Christ. I am an heir to the kingdom of story. You don't need an attention-grabbing before story because you all have an attention-grabbing after story. You are people that have been rescued by God. That is a story to tell. You don't need a road to Damascus, light from heaven, audible voice to have a story to tell. Maybe take from Saul what's really important. He wasted no time and got out there and began telling people about what Jesus did for him. You all have that after story. And you were called to a great purpose, to live and love like Jesus, to know him, to grow up in him, and go out for him. If we learn anything from this story, I think it's this. God revealed Christ to Saul so that he could reveal Christ through Paul. And you know what? The same is true for you. God revealed Christ to you so that he could reveal Christ through you. You intimidated? Good. <laughs> you know what you'll need to do it? Zeal. And you know where you'll get it? It won't be from anything you do. It'll be from God. At the end of this great prophecy in the book of Isaiah, we read it all the time around Christmas. Do you know what it says? It says this, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You pick the this. It's your spreading of the gospel. It's your sticking up for God. It's your witnessing to somebody that you never thought. See, there's a beautiful story to be told. See, the reason why all of this is possible it was because Jesus gave his last breath for a guy like Saul who used his breath to utter murderous phrases and threats to Christians. He used his breath to breathe his last on the cross and say, it is finished, so that he could ascend to heaven and now use his breath, the Holy Spirit, to infuse you and empower you to go out there and be a difference maker in his kingdom. And it won't be anything but the zeal of the Lord Almighty that will accomplish this through you. So take heart. You don't need a compelling backstory because you all have a beautiful after story. You get out there and you remember that Christ revealed, or God revealed Christ to you so he could reveal Christ through you. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks that throughout history, you have saved people like Saul. And I stand here, and I know many else do too, as someone who you saved. And we may not have compelling before stories that make people sit on the edge of their seats, but we have a compelling after story that we are saved from our sin and will be united with you from now into eternity. Lord, Point out the people in our lives that need to hear that message. Let us be like Paul, the apostle, who wasted no time and got out there and spread your gospel. Give us strength, remembering that we have your spirit, giving us everything we need to follow your will. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.